The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Max Hollein, the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, on the plans for the museum's new modern and contemporary wing and his vision for the future. Plus, art in Beirut in the 1960s and Merritt Oppenheim's trust stilettos. I talked to Max Hollein, director of the Met, about the new plans for the museum's wing of modern and contemporary art and how the vision for the museum has changed following the events of the last two years. Also, as the art newspaper publishes its annual museum attendance survey, showing a sector slowly recovering from the pandemic, I asked Hollein about how the Met will adjust to a new era that's been termed living with Covid. Amy Dawson talked to Sam Bader Will about the exhibition Beirut and the Golden Sixties at the Gropiusbau in Berlin. And in this week's Work of the Week, as the Menel Collection in Houston, Texas opens an exhibition of Merritt Oppenheim's work, the curator Natalie Dupesche discusses her surrealist object, Ma Gouvernante, My Nurse, Mein Kindermädchen, a pair of white heels on a silver platter, trussed like a chicken. Before all that, our sister podcast, A Brush With, is back for a new series of four episodes with in-depth artist interviews. The latest episode is A Brush With, Ali Sherry, the Beirutian artist who's just opened an exhibition at London's National Gallery. So subscribe wherever you get your podcast to hear that and to explore the back catalogue of more than 35 conversations. And do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Now, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York last week made a big announcement about its future plans when it confirmed that the Mexico City-based architect Frida Escobedo has been selected to design what the museum calls a reimagining of the current modern and contemporary galleries. The project will create 80,000 square feet of galleries and public space at a cost of $500 million. The announcement was made just as the art newspaper publishes its annual attendance survey, which shows that after a disastrous 2020, when most institutions were closed for much of the year due to the Covid pandemic, museums began slowly to recover in 2021. The Met had close to 2 million visitors last year, but still that was 68% below its numbers for 2019. I spoke to the Met's director, Max Hollein, about the plans for the new wing, the strength of the Met's modern and contemporary collections, and about his vision for the museum in the coming years and beyond. Max, the modern contemporary wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art has been planned for some time now and undergone various changes, but where is it at now? Well, we've been thinking about uh, how to best further advance our modern and contemporary, uh, I would say, agenda and how to improve the galleries for modern and contemporary art for quite some time. And of course, there have been various moments in the last couple of years that basically triggered momentum and important energy for that. I mean, First and foremost, of course, uh, Leonard Lauder's outstanding gift of his Cubist connection to the Met. But actually also, of course, our strong commitment to further expand, diversify and create a new idea about what the Met's involvement with modern, especially contemporary art is. So out of that came, I would say, a new collection development program. I mean, what we collect Out of it came also a new idea about what kind of exhibitions we show. And I think all of that is kind of, especially also with Sheena Wagstaff's leadership of the modern contemporary department, that's linked to it. But also what could be the the right gallery and also the right gallery system for the Met doing that. So we had initially, and it was probably like, I, I think seven years ago, there was a kind of a certain like, first idea about that. And the museum worked with David Chipperfield on developing that design. When I came, I thought it was really important for us to fully address, and it was like almost four years ago, not only that we want to do something, but actually what exactly we want to do in regard to what kind of architectures. I mean, I'm not talking now about the design, uh, but more about the spatial configuration. What kind of narratives do we want to have there? What is really the, the relationship between the architecture and the program? So we developed a fairly specific architectural brief, let me call it that way, which was clearly informed from our experiences at the Met Breuer and others and basically invested probably a year in that. And then with that, we went to a group of architects. So that was David Chipperfield, but also uh, Lacatoma Vassal from Paris, 
Suil from New York, Ensemble Architecture from Madrid and Boston, and Frida's Cathedral from Mexico City. And what we did was, not only did we give them the brief and said, well, show us some ideas or designs, but we worked with each group simultaneously for five months, the entire curatorial team, also our engineers, our technicians, etc., as if we are already the full client. So to see in parallel, developed with each company an idea. And what it allowed us to see was not only what kind of architectural ideas are there, but actually also how these architects work, how we could work together with them. And at the end, together, of course, with our trustees and with the whole group, we decided on Frida Escobedo and chose her as the architect for our modern wing. I have to say with that, in our case, the Met, since it cannot move further into the, the Central Park, a new modern wing basically means tearing down the existing building and building a new one with better galleries. But that was also one part of our brief that we don't want to actually tear down the, the existing building that much. We want to do it in a more ecologically sensitive manner. And there were a lot of other aspects to that. But at the end, we felt Frida is the architect who responded best to the brief, but also who we are looking forward to working together for the next couple of years. That's such a fascinating process. Can you say something about what Fr- you think Frida will bring to it? One of the things that I'm conscious of because of the Serpentine Pavilion is this extraordinary sensitivity to materials and space and light. So obviously all of those things are very crucial to the way that contemporary and modern art are displayed. Are those the sort of things that you're talking about? What kind of spaces is she talking about as well? That's what interests me. Absolutely. I think, I mean, obviously, since you already saw at least one temporary building of Frida Escobedo, the Serpentine Pavilion, but I think that uh, her buildings really stand out for a whole number of reasons. One is exactly for her external sensitivity to material, to space and to light, but also her understanding of space being both an individual as well as communal experience and how these kind of experience, how these spaces can shape both and are an offering in that sense. I think she also is someone who is at the forefront of an architectural practice that really also addresses, so to say, some of the ecological and socio-economical questions of our time. And one must not forget that the building that we are building is, on the one hand, clearly it's a building block, so to say, connected with the rest of the Met. So it has to be sensitive to the existing architecture. On the other hand, it sits also in the park. So we wanted to have a building also that's, so to say, porous to the park, that can be experienced from the park, where you can experience the park from the building, not so much just because there are beautiful trees around there, but I think the park represents also a certain kind of community, a certain also other community experience. And we wanted to have a building that kind of almost like participates in that as well. And so in that sense, I think that this idea of architecture creating almost like a certain idea of community space and on the other hand creating external and perfect galleries for art at kind of merging these two I think that's also where Frida really stands out. You've mentioned the ecological issue building a new building is ruinous environmentally very often so are you saying effectively that, that one of the key reasons that you're taking a new approach is that you're conscious of climate change and you're conscious of what building a new project is within the current context? Absolutely. I'm not saying that this is a very European thing alone, but I think we have seen Europe being on the forefront of that thinking. And I think we're, we're of course, also embracing it in a major way here in the US, especially also for cultural buildings. And so it seemed to us that while we have an existing building that's not ideal for what we want to do, the first approach needs to be look at what you have already and what can be used, what can be repurposed, what do we not have to take down? Because that's the healthier way of approaching it. So that was already part of the brief and we also wanted to have an architect who approaches it that way. From an ecologically more sensitive perspective, Obviously, also ideally, it's financially better in, in that context. It also allows you ideally to, to build in a shorter time. And at the end, you will have, in that sense, a new building, but a building that basically builds on an already existing substance and not everything is always kind of needs to be gutted. Some things can be repurposed, some can, can be rearranged. What was important for us also, I have to say from a spatial concept, is that we strongly believe in a museum building, especially for modern contemporary art, that's not just defined by floor one, two, and three. We want to make sure that we create, in that sense, a non-linear and somewhat also non-hierarchical experience when you walk 
and your path through the building. So it really is also a spatial construct that is thought through very three-dimensional, where, where galleries will vary in high, ceiling height and si uh, size, and where you navigate through the space, and it's not that you go to floor one, two, and three. That was another part of the brief. How involved have artists been? Because obviously artists are the key constituents in many ways of what you'll be dealing with in these spaces. And I know that other museum projects have involved artists at their core. So we didn't have artists as part of our, let's see, internal working group, because again, we, we wanted to almost like we present as if you are the client. But of course, a lot of our thinking is influenced not only by a lot of conversations with artists, but actually also by experiences working with artists in our spaces. I would say that the, the current show that we have of Charles Ray's sculpture at the Met is outstanding, not only because Charles Ray is such a great sculptor, but he's also such a perfect installer of his sculpture. His sculpture in itself has so much to do with space. So it was just that as an example, working on a show like that with Charles Ray allows you to understand what kind of space you want, what kind of space you need, and how artists can work in that space. I was joking with Charlie Ray, actually, uh, because a lot of people who now come through that show and see these spaces, they say, oh, you have these fantastic spaces, why do you need a modern wing? These are already great. So you see how working with an artist can really get the best out of your already existing substance. So we had a lot of conversation with them and we will continue to have a lot of conversations with artists for the med space. I'm very conscious doing another podcast where I talk to artists about museums, that artists have a very particular attachment to the Met and they will want, I'm sure, to very much reach out when they display at the Met to the other parts of the collection to connect to those extraordinary realms of different cultures. So you talked about the porosity of the building. To what extent is it porous from within, if you like, to incorporate those other collections? Well, I think that for us, it's absolutely important that our suggestion of how you can look at the development of modern and contemporary art, or just in general about modern and contemporary art, will be totally transcultural and also transhistoric. So you will have not only the dialogues across histories, you will also have a very, I would say, much more global perspective, informed by, let's say, the, the other part of the Met, which given our DNA is kind of to be, uh, of course, culturally very diverse and ideally also be uh, strong in kind of creating this trans-historic region. So that will be in a city like New York, where you have a fair amount of really outstanding museums for modern and contemporary art. I think the Mets collection is very good, very special, but I think also the Mets way of displaying it will offer different, so to say, even experience or, or suggestion. I think that's crucial and important. One other aspect to that, since you mentioned it, is Initially, I have to see in our initial building concept, there was always kind of a white cube performance space on the top floor. And I always felt we don't need that because in reality, every artist coming to Met about anything performance, they want to have performances at the Temple of Dendor, in the Great Hall, in these already very charged environments. We don't want to create in that sense neutral spaces. We want to create spaces that where, where artists want to engage with and where, where they want to be engaged with in that context. So I think that the artists love the Met because of our collections, because of what the Met represents, but also because they come already in a fairly charged environment that can amplify their work or, or can challenge their work in a certain way. And you will have some of that, of course, also in our new Tang Wing. You've alluded to the sort of uniqueness of the Met as a space for contemporary and modern art, but of course there are people that wonder why in such a crowded field for museums of modern and contemporary art in New York there is such an emphasis and half a billion dollars being spent on a new modern and contemporary space. What do you say to those people? So from an institutional perspective, I think it's important to stress uh, not only that the Met has always collected contemporary throughout its over 150-year history. Some of our founding trustees were artists. But also from a, like idea of this institution, however you call it, a universal museum, or previously it was called the encyclopedic museum, which are, all of these terms are, are complicated. But basically the idea that we collect various cultures from all around the world, from the beginning to now, is something that's really important for us to do. And that differentiates us from other peer institutions globally. So the, the Louvre 
stops collecting around 1800. The Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna doesn't have a uh, modern contemporary part. The Hermitage in St. Petersburg doesn't, etc. So I think that the Met is the one museum where you really have this development of culture, the development of cultures up until the current moment. And we definitely don't want to lose that. I would also argue that the best kept secret still at the Met is the extraordinary quality and diversity of our collection of 20th and 21st century art. You will, even you, let me put it this way, will be surprised what <laughs> extraordinary works we have once we open that new wing. It's basically something that has been at the Met for a long time. We've, be, we've been collecting in that area vigorously and with a lot of scholarly foundation. So we need to continue. And in regard to when you say, well, it's already a crowded field, I agree with that. But I think that the way the Met can do it and the way how you can experience it, the Met, will be entirely different to the other institutions. And we see it even with our shows. I mean, you know, the, MoMA is doing fantastic contemporary shows. The Guggenheim is doing fantastic contemporary shows. The Whitney does it. The New Museum does it. And then when we do it, people come as well because it, there's a different thing. So it's, it's not saturation. It's more... When we want to live in a world that offers multiple perspectives, and I think we all agree that that's something that we want, from museums in general, the Met has not only one, but multiple perspectives to offer. And that will be great for, for the art of the 20th and 21st century as well. And is there any kind of collecting drive in the head of the new opening? Are you going to prioritise modern and contemporary art in that time? And for instance, is the head of Fernand by Picasso, which you are deaccessioning, is that kind of sale going to contribute to a fund for modern and contemporary art, which will work towards this new opening? Clearly, in the last seven years, our collection program in that area has expanded significantly. In the modern area, I mean, that there, especially with Leonard Lauder's gift, but also others, uh, and also in the contemporary area. I mean, Sheena Wagstaff and her team, and that a team that clearly expanded, also kind of ventured out in all different areas. So we, we are building that, and we have significant resources doing that to the generosity of our donors and endowments. But as clearly more that we, we are doing. And uh, indeed, the deaccessioning of one of the two casts that we have of Picasso's Fernand, so we are in a very luxurious position to have two of the same sculpture, will clearly further support our acquisition program, especially also in the area of modern contemporary art. I'm talking to you just as the art newspaper is about to publish its attendance survey. Obviously, visitors to museums have massively fallen because of COVID. How does that affect your programming going forward? And indeed, your approach to audiences, which is what this is about. So I think, first of all, we made a very conscious decision when we reopened, which, I mean, you, we were closed for about six months. And when we reopened and we knew, of course, that the our attendance would be much lower and it will be mainly local. We basically also said, well, it doesn't matter how many people can visit us, we will come out with the best program possible. So that's why we then opened with the about time show at the Costume Institute, with our Goya exhibition, with Alice Neal, with the Medici show, etc., etc. So we didn't make a difference how many people can visit us and saying, okay, well, if not 7 million, but actually only 3.5 million can visit us, let's lower the program. Uh, no, we wanted to make the best offering that the Met can do for our audiences. And yes, the, our audiences at the beginning were only local. Then they expanded. We saw a significant uptick in tourism coming from within the US, actually more than before. We are right now at about 65% of our visitor numbers before. Uh, we clearly have now more international visitors, but there's a strong component of our visitorship that's not here yet. It might still take two or three years to come back in that context. Right now, we probably have a higher percentage compared to the total of local visitors, much higher than we had before, which basically means we have currently percentage-wise more repeat visitors coming to the institution, following basically every change and transformation of the galleries. So what it means is that basically some of projects that basically have to do more with kind of reconfiguring the idea of how the museum represents itself. 
think about the Afro Futurist period room that we, we opened. Or right now the, the Capot show, which challenges the idea of a certain 19th century sculpture by Capot, that that's being seen by, actually by more people. There's a higher alertness to that. And so it allows you to have a kind of a, a stronger uh, and more intimate, in that sense, relationship with a local audience. But of course, many other things have changed for our institution during COVID. I think the biggest transformation for us was clearly the enormous expansion, actually, of the museum. Uh, and so that might sound like, what, what is he talking about in regard to that? But basically, because of an audience that during COVID got so versatile and so experienced in receiving and engaging with digital content, our museum has expanded tremendously not only in our digital offerings, but in our ability to reach a digital audience. Uh, and a digital audience that is no longer just a young audience or digital natives, but really everyone is engaging on that level. So we have expanded our educational offerings, our narratives, our storytelling, our accessibility and all of that in such a tremendous way that I would argue that the museum has grown in the last three years, more than any time before in regard to that. And with that, also our audience has grown. Our on-site audience is catching up, but our uh, online audience and our engagement there, which allows us to be really multi-local in so many other areas around the world, has grown significantly. And of course, you know, both in terms of the digital offering, but also in terms of the museum itself, I'm intrigued by to what extent there is a sort of renewed emphasis on the collection. When I spoke to Dan Weiss in 2020, he and lots of other museum directors actually were talking about a re-emphasis on collections and fewer blockbuster exhibitions. Is that still the intent of the museum? Do you see that as the route forward? Well, for us, everything starts with the collection. And I mean, of course, the Met has outstanding collections in so many areas. So for us, that's always the starting point. Clearly, also, the last two and a half or three years allowed us to even scrutinize our collections more, to reevaluate them, to actually see also where we are falling short and what needs to be surfaced more. And not only how we can further diversify our collection, but how we can also diversify the voices that we articulate through our collection, but who we have engaging with our collection. So all of that creates, I would say, a more complex program, a more deeper program in that. And you, you see a, a lot of that already uh, unfolding. I never use, of course, the term blockbuster exhibition. We still are strong believers in the idea of major exhibitions, because I think that an exhibition in itself is still the best way to articulate to a broad audience a complex art historical, sometimes historical, sometimes political, sometimes also socio-economic context about a broad artistic development. Uh, you cannot do that on that level just with a collection hang. So I'm a strong advocate and believer in exhibitions, but I, I, I totally agree, and also, of course, with Dan, that there's a trajectory uh, for us to have so much more dynamic, so much more energy coming out of our collections and our understanding and our scholarship on the collection and to kind of, to be also more honest about it. So I think we share a lot of our scholarship about our collections. It's sometimes also more interesting though for our audience to, to understand and to hear what we don't know, what we don't understand, where we are insecure, where we want to in invite others to help us kind of bring the best voices forward. So all of that, I think, is in, in a very dynamic state. You talked about diversity and diversifying collections, etc. I lastly wanted to ask you about the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. The museum, alongside lots of other museums, made statements along the lines of how it was going to improve the way it approached equity and diversity. What have you done and how integral to the new wing and all your other programming will be that kind of ethos? Almost all institutions in the U.S. saw that as a moment of, on the one hand, reconning, but also as a moment to, to really look at ourselves and see where we have fallen short, where we lack even a certain level of understanding, where we have to learn more. And on the other hand, also understanding it, it's not just listening. You need to, to take action in a holistic and broader way. So we didn't want to just acknowledge this with kind of a couple of statements. We put out a program after a lot of deliberation, but fairly quickly, our 13 commitments that kind of already listed all the different actions that we would 
take and we would want to take, the commitments that we make moving forward. And that means not only diversifying our collections, it doesn't mean only diversifying our staff, it really means creating an institution that is very much committed to a certain level of anti-racist, not only training our staff, uh, activity in that context, but also understanding that uh, our activity goes across the whole board. It means who we work with, what kind of like bidding process do we have, what kind of process we do have to welcome actually new staff into the institution and include them. How we are working in regard to both our trustees and our board, our volunteer groups and all of that. So it basically, I think it's, it was a starting point for a next evolution for this institution where we are continuously being in that process, but we, where we are seeing also already significant results all around. On the other hand, it also helped us come together more as a community, be more critical about ourselves. We probably have been also a bit insecure in that. Uh, and it allows us also a certain level of humility to understand, well, actually, no, we need to do better. We can do better. And here is how we can do better. Max, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, man. The Met's exhibition, Charles Ray, Figure Ground, continues until the 5th of June, and you can hear Charles talk about his experiences in the Met on the podcast A Brush With Charles Ray, wherever you're listening now. The Art Newspaper's annual survey of visitor attendance is in the April print edition, out on the 1st of April, and also next week online at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android, which you can get from the App Store or Google Play. Coming up, we hear about Beirut in the 1960s and Merit Oppenheim's surrealist masterpiece, Ma Gouvernante. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. The visionary art collector and Yuz Museum founder Budiajo Budi Tech has died aged 65 from pancreatic cancer. As Lisa Movius writes, the Indonesian Chinese businessman is best known for his art collection with a focus on Chinese contemporary art and for founding Yuz Museum Shanghai, which since its opening in 2014 has exhibited international artists including Cause, Alberto Giacometti and Andy Warhol, while pushing for greater recognition of both Chinese contemporary artists and emerging international names. Art Basel has announced the details of its forthcoming Paris Fair, which ousted FIAC from its October slot and sent shockwaves through the industry. As Kabir Jalla writes, the event is called Paris Plus by Art Basel and will take place from the 20th to the 23rd of October at the temporary Grand Palais Ephemeraire, shifting to the Grand Palais itself from 2024 once its 600 million euros renovation is complete. It will be directed by Clément Delépine, the former co-director of the Paris International Fair, which focuses on younger and emerging galleries and has run alongside FIAC since 2015. He will be joined by General Manager Virginie Aubert, former Vice President of Christie's France and Deputy Director Maxime Audequin, who was formerly Deputy Director of FIAC. A museum in the besieged Ukrainian port city Mariupol, dedicated to the 19th century artist Arkib Kuinji, who both Russians and Ukrainians embrace as their own, was destroyed by an airstrike on Monday morning, Ukrainian media reported. As Sofia Kishkovsky writes, Kuinji, who was of Greek descent, was born in Mariupol and was initially a member of the 19th century Russian realist art movement known as the Wanderers. Konstantin Cherniaski, chairman of the National Artists' Union of Ukraine, told Local History, a culture website based in Lviv that the museum has three original works by Kuinji in its collection, shown alongside copies of his canvases and original paintings by other artists. At the time of the bombing, the Kuinji paintings were not in the museum and their current whereabouts are unknown. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Welcome the spring season at Christie's New York with exceptional pieces to be auctioned during the online sales from photographs, the collector and the Richard Gere collection. Engage in an implicit dialogue between French and European porcelain, 18th century furniture and works of art alongside photographs by some of the most significant 20th century artists such as Alfred Stieglitz, Richard Avedon and Diane Arbus. Find out more at christies.com. Welcome back. 
Now, the Gropiusbau Museum in Berlin has just opened the exhibition Beirut and the Golden Sixties, a manifesto of fragility. With around 220 works by 36 artists, more than 200 archival documents and a new multimedia commission by the artist Joanna Haji Thomas and Halil Jorej, the show reveals the little-known strand of modernism that blossomed in the Lebanese capital from 1958 to 1975. Our deputy digital editor Amy Dawson spoke to Sam Bardawil, the co-curator of the show along with Till Fel rats about the lure of Beirut in the 60s, the artist who flocked there and why the period turned out to be not so golden after all. Sam, thank you so much for talking to us about this really fascinating show. So it looks at modernism in Beirut from the 1958 Lebanon crisis all the way through to 1975, just as the civil war begins which then goes on for 15 long years. The press release for this show reads kind of like the setting of a movie. That's how I felt when I was reading it, describing how these various political and social circumstances in the 60s kind of led Beirut to become this hub of intellectuals and creatives with this influx of money and innovation. And it just sounds like such an exhilarating time. But you're also trying to dispel a myth about a so-called golden age. So can you describe to me what the art scene in Beirut was like at this time and that harbinger of the future to come that was bubbling up under the surface? First of all, I think it's it's probably important to start at the current moment today and kind of uh, perhaps let you in on one of the central questions that have been guiding our thinking about the exhibition. As you can imagine, when communities, societies, nations go through times of crises, they start looking back towards any moment in their history that signals a certain utopia that can somehow help us in going through the current moment when it's a dark moment. So I think a lot of people in the last couple of years in Lebanon, because of everything that's been going on, people in Beirut have been thinking back about the past and saying, oh, you know, we had our golden age, we had our great moment. We wish we could go back to those times when indeed there was this influx of money and capital and energy and and, uh, cultural practitioners and ideas coming and finding their place in Beirut and growing. But then we had to stop for a second and ask ourselves if indeed things were super, super great and flowery and rosy and perfect. Why did we suddenly have a civil war erupting in 1975 and lasting for 15 years, Mm -hmm. the repercussions of which and the complications of which are still very felt until this current moment? So in a way, the exhibition tries to go back in time and look at that period in order to somehow grapple with the threads of the issues and the factors and the problematics that up until today are still impacting the current politics, the current conflict, the current crisis that we are living in Lebanon and Beirut. So I think it's very important to mention this because the exhibition on one hand is indeed looking back at that moment, but it's very much an attempt to understand today through the very complex and pivotal period that Beirut uh, went through during these long 1960s, if I can use that word. Mm. So if we talk about the art scene in Beirut in the 60s, it was fabulous with a big, big F. (laughs) (laughs) There were so many artists, so many cultural practitioners. I'm talking about visual artists. I'm talking about theater practitioners. I'm talking about writers, authors, dancers, musicians, and political activists who were all coming to Beirut to have their big moment under the spotlight. I think Beirut at the time was the place where if you wanted to be noticed regionally and if you wanted to be picked up, let's say, by curators or international dealers to expand and start showing in other centers of artistic production in Europe, in the States, um, in other parts of Asia, Beirut was the gateway. It was the place to go. So everybody wanted to be there. And of course, when people come from different places, they bring their different ways of life. They bring their different cultural effects 
affinities, but they also bring their political projects. And artists, like many other people in society, had their own political ideologies that they sometimes felt their art could help them put these ideologies forward. Through their art, they could disseminate or create an awareness about certain issues that they felt very, very uh, attached to. So in a way, the microcosm that the art world was is a very interesting mirroring of the diversity that was actually very much present and, and felt when you went to Beirut. It sounds like a fascinating time and just thinking about all of that creativity and also the friction that was working away under the surface. One of the things that's interesting about this show and also about things you've done in the past is that curators have been looking at modernism inside out for decades, but you and your co-curator, Till, who work together a lot, focus a lot on challenging the canon of modernism and highlighting artistic centres that have been kind of ignored in art history. And I'm thinking about your exhibition, Surrealism in Egypt, which toured from mm -hmm. the Pompidou in Paris to the Reina Sofia and also to Tate Liverpool in the UK. Why is it important to you to reveal these kind of unknown stories, perhaps smaller scenes that have been ignored thus far? Well, I think at the bottom of it, it's about addressing a certain injustice. I think a lot of art history, like many other histories, have been written from the centers of power, from the point of view of the conqueror, in a sense. And in the process, there's been a lot of leveling, a lot of reductionism, whereby anything that did not fit within the temporality or the aesthetics or the formal progression of certain styles and movements, anything that didn't fit within those centralized kind of narratives was discarded as either irrelevant or epigonic, or derivative, or a copy of an original. And I think this is symptomatic in a sense of so many structures of inequity by which we have inherited forms of knowledge that have not allowed for other voices, other positions that have been marginalized to be heard for their own sake, to be addressed within their own parameters and not always within this normative comparison that happens when you look at an artist and you say, it looks like Picasso or it looks mm -hmm. like, um, I don't know, somebody else. So this is really about addressing this injustice and ab about opening up the canon so that we can benefit from the very, very complex types of relationships that have existed between artists throughout and this is why whenever we work on these types of exhibitions, we go back and try to excavate the very, very precise relationships by which artists created work, the conversations they had, the correspondence that they had, the exhibitions that they visited or ex exhibited along with other artists and, and so on and so forth, the relationships, the love affairs, the falling outs, all of these things, taking it back to the personal level, the micro level, and from there, try to rebuild these pieces of the puzzle. So a certain story emerges that has its own specificity, that makes sense within its own universe, and then adds to our understanding of the bigger picture. And this is something that we always get very excited about, because on one hand, it is the meta interest is about addressing this injustice in a sense, but it's also about learning and getting excited about all these amazing things that for us many times are also new encounters that we haven't been aware of before. And the way that you describe approaching these exhibitions, the excavating and, and finding out the personal stories completely makes sense in my reading of the press release, almost like a movie, because I think it does draw out those personal and intriguing backstories. And one of the things when I was looking into the development for this project is you put together an absolutely enormous online project, Witness to a Golden Age, Mapping Beirut's Art Scene which obviously must have helped to develop this show, but also acts as kind of a great resource for anyone interested in delving deeper into this period, particularly if they see this show and want to learn more. Can you tell a, a little bit about that project? Of course, and, and thank you for bringing it out. It's in a way exactly that moment where ideas started developing towards this exhibition that we're experiencing now, but that was back in 2017, 
when we were asked by an art foundation in Lebanon, the Saradar collection, to actually work on something that is called perspective. So they have this series of programs, and unfortunately, they managed to do the first one, which we curated, and then the crisis in 2019 unraveled, and this program had to be stopped. But what we did is we actually thought it would be important to do exactly that, um, to go back and look at all the players, all the art spaces that were functioning and active in Beirut, 50s, 60s, and, um, and 70s. And it was amazing to discover more than 60, 70 art spaces in that very small city, relatively speaking, putting out exhibitions that ranged from local practitioners to international superstars at the time, like Max Aaron for instance, or Wifredo Lam opening up on different geographies, bringing modernism from Mexico, uh, from Brazil. So it was such a prolific moment. And uh, we managed to put together something like 1,200 archival documents online for more than, I would say, around 400 exhibitions that we managed to excavate from that period. And when you go on that website, you can actually have an interactive map where you can see these places on the map and you click on these places and then you see all the exhibitions that happened there within that time frame and then you can click on every exhibition and find all the relevant documents that we managed to retrace. So it's really for scholars, it's really for artists, it's really for anyone who is interested uh, to learn more about that time and all this material is downloadable, we managed to get all the copyrights and it's all for free. So the idea again is to democratize access to art history, to materials, to research, so anyone can actually benefit from that. It's such a great project. And let's talk about the show now. I thought maybe we could talk about it kind of running through, because there are five thematic sections, the place, the body, the form, the politics and the war. So perhaps you could briefly describe each one and some of the key works that are in it and how you came to structure it in this way. Well, I think this confrontation of what is seen as a golden age and all the underlying problems that come with it since that period onwards is kind of the way we start the show. The opening of the show starts with a a juxtaposition of two images. One image is a blown up archival photograph of women swimming in the Mediterranean, the Lebanese beach, the famous Riviera of the Middle East. But then we have a painting by a Lebanese self-taught naive artist from the 50s. Uh, His name is Khalil Zogeib. And it's a painting of that same beach but there are no people, you know, swimming or having fun. It's actually an American military operation, the landing of the American troops in 1958 on that beach to come and uh, make sure that the Lebanese government is pro-American rather than kind of being swayed into the communist Russian axis. So it was the first and biggest military invasion to be encountered in the modern period in the Middle East, and yet most people don't even realize that this happened. This was just before this kind of golden age. So the exhibition starts with this confrontation to set the rhythm for this problematic that develops throughout the exhibition. So the first section, the place, is basically a way of introducing the notion of Beirut, the image of Beirut, the, the, the dream that Beirut was for many people. And one major painting in the section is by a French artist who lived in Lebanon and was married to a Lebanese Armenian. Her name is Simone Baltaxé Matrayan. And it's a monumental painting that shows people constructing some sort of edifice. And it beckons us to ask the question, how do you construct a place or the notion of a place belonging to an identity? belonging to um, a culture, given the fact that Beirut was so radically cosmopolitan at the time. And this is how it starts. And then in the second section, the body, we go straight into how artists in Beirut at the time were trying to look at the politics of the body, of gender, of sexuality. Beirut and Lebanon were uh, relatively uh, free haven in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of people with all sorts of lifestyles coming and finding a niche for themselves. And there were a lot of uh, movements you know, informed by what was happening in the rest of the world at the time, feminist movements, liberation movements. And you see that in a lot of the work, works that deal with gender, sexuality, 
sexuality, from a feminist point of view, from a gender fluid point of view, and you would be stunned to see works that kind of are precursors of a lot of art that comes decades later in other parts of the world dealing with these questions. And then in the third section, which is the form, we get to the crux of the show. At the moment in Beirut, there was a big conversation going on about what can an artist um, adopt as a style in order to develop something that is genuinely local. This was something that was happening in a lot of countries that came out from colonial rule. Lebanon came out from the French mandate in 1943. And many artists in Lebanon and the region and other non-Lebanese artists were coming to Lebanon and trying to articulate a language that was building on some sort of local or regional vernacular. So you see a lot of artists working with, you know, references to Islamic miniature or local architecture or Phoenician myth and mythology and so on and so forth. And this was all within this kind of line of thinking that art needs to reflect an identity, a cultural uh, affinity that exists beyond and outside of the colonial period. And while that was happening, you had a lot of artists who was also working with the tropes of abstraction, the tropes of minimalism, the tropes of kinetic light sculpture, for instance, and which in a way that seems to be more aligned with what was a European way of thinking about art in, let's say, Paris, London, or even in North America, that could have been because of their education or their style. So you see artists working with so many different forms, and the form becomes an assertion of their political uh, project, their political identity, their political affinities. So you start seeing this tension building up, and then you get to the political section, the politics, where you see works that were outright political, carrying the cause of either the Palestinian plight, the Vietnam War, the war in Algiers, the 1967 war. So a lot of works that were dealing directly with specific historical events until you get to the last section, which is the, the war section. And that's where it takes a turn and everything gets very grim and the works change in scale and you see a lot of black and white and you see a lot of images of destruction, obviously. And it, it really shows you what a rupture that was for many, many artists, both in terms of production, but also in terms of being in Lebanon, many people leave. And at the very end of the show, we have a new commission by Joanna Haji Thomas and Khalil Jrej that links all these ideas and all these questions through what happened in 2020, the explosion of August 4. And it's a work that is on one hand an immersive multi-video channel installation that is silent. And on the other hand, it's a sound piece that works with poetry and wonders if poetry can somehow become a form of resilience, the spoken word vis-a-vis -vis the still image or the silent image and what happens when you confront poetry to chaos and what happens to artworks when they experience such aggression. And this is how the exhibition finishes. As you walk out, you see one last painting by Huguette Calon, a very large piece. It's a monumental piece in the show where she tells the story of Lebanon from 1943 until 1991. It's the only work that is a little bit out of the time frame, but it's a very special painting because she's telling the entire history as a story to her granddaughter. Her granddaughter, who probably experienced the civil war as a young girl, or maybe her mother did. And, and it's about this intergenerational struggle that continues until this very moment. And this exhibition is in partnership with the Leon Biennale, which opens in September, <laughs> which you're also co-curating with Till. Correct. And part of that big show is a section that is from this Golden Age exhibition. How similar will this Correct. presentation be to that one at Gropius Bau? Yeah, I mean, perhaps you've noticed that the subtitle of the show is A Manifesto of Fragility, mm. which is exactly the title of the Lyon Biennale. So from the very, very beginning, we have been conceiving this exhibition as one of the chapters, one of the components, central components of what we are going to be showing at the Biennale in Lyon. It's a case in point. It's an example of a city through which we can uh, learn something about fragility, about resistance and about the cycles of history. And in Lyon, most of the exhibition will be the same. There will be some adaptations, but there will be one major section that will be added that highlights the connections between France and Lebanon 
from the 19th century onwards, and in particular focuses on the relations between Beirut and Lyon, Lyon being a center of silk production for a very long time, and the impact that this had on the silk factories in Lebanon, the rise of the Lebanese bourgeoisie in the 19th century, the immigration movement, but also the installation of the French mandate due to a lot of pushing from the Lyon Chamber of Commerce. So there's a lot of histories that, again, we have excavated that will shed a different light on the overall framework until we arrive to the 1960s and understand what's going on at the time. Coming all the way to the 2020, when Macron comes back to that port that was for many centuries the place of encounter and exchange for goods, for ideas, for politics, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, we've lost some very important figures from the Arab art world uh, in the last few months, like Atel Adnan and Mona Saudi. True. And this will be a great opportunity to see their work among their contemporaries. Can you talk a bit about the works that are on show? I mean, I knew both of the two artists that you mentioned very well over the years. Actually, uh, at one point, I was back in Lebanon teaching at the American University of Beirut, and uh, Muna Saoudi was also teaching. I was teaching art history. She was teaching sculpture in the arts department. So we used to hang out a lot. And I remember Muna as this unrelenting artist, both in terms of her insistence on kind of chiseling away at stone, literally, <laughs> and changing, you know, its, its materiality in a sense, to give it a lightness, to give it a, a softness or a certain texture that usually doesn't yield, but also her relentlessness as someone with very strong convictions. By the same token, of course, over so many years of exchange with Simone Fatal and Ital Adnan, you get to see a very different type of resilience and insistence on writing, on making art, on transforming the condition of being in between worlds, not to a form of exile, but to a form of belonging. And I remember that in the exhibition, we were placing one of the Leporellos of Etel Adnan in a case. And it's a very, very big case because it's a very long Leporello and the art handlers and us were carrying the, the big case, the, the glass case and moving it through a wall to cover the actual piece. And I had a moment where I felt like we were burying Etel again. Mm. There was this huge piece that looked like a coffin with six men carrying it and bringing it over and putting it over this artwork. And this is where the exhibition is more than just showing artworks for me personally, but also for Till. And I speak for him as well, because he's also known these artists for many years. We've both been going to Lebanon. I mean, I'm born in Lebanon. I'm from Lebanon, but Till as well has been going there for years. The exhibition is more than just putting artworks or fighting for an, uh, a modernist movement to be acknowledged. In a way, it is my form of activism. By putting these works out there, every work that came out from a crate is actually a memory of me having lived through some of these conditions, some of these conflicts, some of these difficult moments, but also some of these triumphs and some of these celebrations and some of these achievements. So it's a bittersweet thing, but at the end, it is my form of activism. I put these artworks there, we make this exhibition because that's what we know how to do. Mm. I can go down on the streets, I can support people going through difficult times in different ways like we all do, but ultimately I would hope that the conversations that this exhibition triggers and the awareness that it creates will lead to a shift in perception, to a conversation that is ongoing, that allows for us to have a little bit more empathy perhaps with those who have been less fortunate, but also to understand that things could go sour at any minute, like we are seeing with the world today in many, many places. And of course, the, what's happening in the Ukraine is a very sad but true example. Things could change anywhere, anytime. A city could be in the middle of its golden age, yet in one turn, festering things could take grip and things become irreconcilable and it explodes. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Of course, thank you so much for giving us the time. And I do hope that many people come and see the show and engage in its content. 
Beirut and the Golden Sixties, a manifesto of fragility, is at the Gropiusbau in Berlin until the 12th of June. And another exhibition at the museum is Dianita Singh, Dancing with My Camera, until the 12th of August. You can hear my conversation with Dianita in our podcast series, A Brush With. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The Menel Collection in Houston, Texas, has just opened Merit Oppenheim, my exhibition, the first major survey of the Swiss artist's work in the US for a quarter of a century. It features pieces from across Oppenheim's 50-year career, including her great surrealist objects from the 1930s. The best known of these is Object, the cup, spoon and saucer covered in the pelt of a Chinese gazelle. But that work was originally shown in Paris alongside a similarly witty and powerful sculpture made up of found objects, Magu my nurse, mein Kindermädchen of 1936, a pair of white heels trussed together with string on a silver platter. And it's this work that Nathalie Dupeche, the curator of the Menel exhibition, chose to talk about. Nathalie, where was Merit Oppenheim when she made this work and what were her circumstances? Merit Oppenheim had been living in Paris since about 1932 when she made the work Ma Gouvernante, My Nurse, My Kindermädchen. She'd been living in Paris for a few years, but actually seems to have made this work in Basel. She had her family living there, her grandparents were living there, and she was spending time in Paris, but was going back to Switzerland for the summers, for winter holidays. And so interestingly, she writes about making this work of art in Basel, which is different than a lot of the other object constructions and works that she made in Paris in the early and mid 1930s. Now, one of the things about Merit Oppenheim, because of the fame around object, which is the fur lined cup and spoon and saucer. And one of the things I hadn't realized is that there's such a sort of directness and maturity in that language. I hadn't realized how young she was when she made it. She's really young at this point, isn't she? Yes, she was only 22. She went to Paris When she was 18 years old, she wanted to become an artist and was very driven in this pursuit. So she goes to Paris, she attends some art school classes, she finds them boring and very quickly really makes a path for herself with the surrealist artists. She begins exhibiting with them. Her work is reproduced in surrealist journals. She's signing surrealist declarations. So there's a real sense, even though she's quite young, she's in her teens and early 20s, that she is really making things happen for herself and quite driven in this wish to be affiliated with this group. Indeed. Tell us more about her connection to the Surrealists. How did she become involved? Because it's not obvious that a, a young woman just heading to Paris is going to be connected to this, you know, very, very brittle group of avant-garde figures who are kind of outcasts, but also deep engage with some pretty difficult subjects at that time, this very revolutionary moment. So how does she become involved? The first connection, she tells us, is that she meets Alberto Giacometti in a cafe in the fall of 1932. So he's her first sort of entree into that group. Later that fall, she welcomes Giacometti and Hans Arp to her studio, which is really like her hotel room, to show them some of the works that she's been doing in those early months in Paris. And they are, it seems, quite taken with her art. And so it's from there that she exhibits with them, with the Surrealists first in one of the salons that occurs in 1933. And she writes to her mother that fall, she says something like, I hope you aren't expecting any good reviews, but for me it was enough that I got to exhibit with some of the best painters. So she, you know, is really like wanting to make this happen for herself. And interestingly, if we go back even before she goes to Paris, there's a oft-repeated story that when she was 16 years old, she gave her father a drawing that she had made where she wrote the equation x equals and drew a little orange rabbit. So x equals rabbit. (laughs) And this was taken as the sign that she was in a way like surrealist before she even met the surrealist, like interested in absurdity, in overturning the rules of logic and mathematical certainty, so that there was already something in her kind of disposition that 
brought her to the movement, that she was sort of already there. Like she met the Surrealists and it clicked, but she was already in this path even before having gone to Paris. And was she making objects in those early shows? Because like, obviously this is a great surrealist object that we're going to talk about. But was she always an object maker? When she first goes to Paris, what she really makes at first are drawings that are wonderful, very economical, kind of funny, witty sketches. Her first object she makes in 1933, so around that time, but it's a little bit of an outlier. It's a work that she titles Head of a Drowned Man, Third Version. It's a work that no longer exists, but consisted, she tells us, of a board that she sawed into the approximate shape of a face and studded with sugared almonds. So already there, there's this like funny sort of surrealist, you know, interest in unconventional materials, a kind of interest in narrative or the suggestion of story. The title is really alluring and enigmatic. It poses questions like, was there a first and second version of this head of a drowned man? So there are sort of breadcrumbs, you know, in retrospect already in 1933. But then, like I said, she's making drawings, she's making paintings, and it's really, I think, not until in early 1936 that she makes these two icons of surrealism, the fur-lined teacup and the, the shoes, the Magouvernant shoes. Okay, so let's talk about Magouvernant then. T- tell us about the assembly of this work, because it's very simple, and yet mm-hmm. it's so utterly surrealist in, in the way that it combines these simple things to conjure all sorts of notions, right? Yes, it is a pair of white high-heeled shoes tied together with string and placed on a silver oval platter. You know, it really consists of just those sort of four elements that now are really just two things, the silver platter and the shoes that are tied together. And it recalls when you see it really like immediately, indelibly, sort of hilariously looks like a trussed chicken or a sort of bird that you have readied for roasting, right down to these frilly paper caps that she puts on the heels of the shoes as though to like prevent the drumsticks from burning or something. So it's a very funny work, and that's a real through line in a lot of her career is just this interest in in humor and wit and a kind of biting sense of humor. But she's also, you know, really interested and will be for much of her career in codes of femininity and sort of gender. And so this work really brings that to the forefront as well. And of course, there's this sort of aspect of sexual fetish, which must have Mm -hmm. appealed to the surrealists who were so often writing about deviant notions of sexuality and so on. Yes, I think this is not a story that's in circulation in 1936, but she'll later say in interviews when she begins being interviewed in the 70s and 80s that she was inspired to create this work by a young nanny that she had when she was a child of four or five. She says that it was a nanny who dressed in white and radiated this sort of sensual atmosphere and says that this is something that unconsciously registered with her and that led her to create the shoe work and is perhaps the nurse, the gouvernante, the kindermädchen of the title, which is another very sort of surrealist story, this idea of an unconscious imprint left from childhood too. And in your essay, you make this intriguing point, and you use that wonderful quote from Breton, which is so inimitably him, which is about how surrealist objects hunt down the mad beast of function. And you suggest that, in a way, Oppenheim's objects almost preempt the way that Breton describes them. It's not that she's fitting in with him, it's almost like she's defining this conception of these objects, almost as Breton is writing them. Yes, I think something that was a sort of important idea to suggest, especially in thinking quite specifically when I was doing the research about the timeline of when everything happened. And Magouvernant is first exhibited at Merit Oppenheim's first ever solo show that happens in Basel in April of 1936. 
So I don't imagine that Breton saw it there, but it was then exhibited at the Gallery Breton show, the famous surrealist exhibition of objects, not exhibition of surrealist objects, a month later. And it seems very, very likely that she had made the fur-lined teacup already before any of that, sometime in March or so. So it does seem to me that her really quite idiosyncratic and brilliant distillation of this idea of the surrealist object of like two things that don't belong together, but you put them together and they completely spectacularly overturn our understanding of them and of the world in general. Like that is really an Oppenheim thing. And I think what's present, yes, even as Breton was, was starting to formulate his theory of the surrealist object. And it's difficult to underestimate the power of that show, isn't it? That Gallery Raton show, because the notion of the surrealist object was basically defined in that show and it's kind of rippled ever since. Yes, yes. And one thing that's fascinating, I mean, there's many things that are fascinating about that show. It was only on for a week, right? So that's already quite an outsized, you know, ripple effects that it had. And the other thing is that although her fur-lined teacup is exhibited there and is kind of the iconic work that one remembers, she also exhibited the shoes, the My Nurse work, and the head of a drowned man that I referenced earlier in that show. They aren't in the catalog, but they are in installation photos. So she had several contributions to that show. And actually when Alfred Barr, the then director of MoMA, requested Merit Oppenheim to lend some of her works to the big MoMA show that happens in December of 1936, Fantastic Art Dada Surrealism. He asks for all three, which is also a really, you know, fascinating to wonder what would have happened if they had gone to, because the teacup is the only thing she sends. And it's in that circumstance that the teacup absolutely explodes. But if she had sent the other two, what might have happened? Might they have been the things that became completely iconic? Indeed. Um, I noticed also that Dora Maar took a photograph of this. And again, you know, you, you talk about the impact, not just amongst a wider community, but within the Surrealists. You know, the fact that Maar took that photograph seems to me significant. Yes, yes. And I think Oppenheim says later that she hadn't asked Mar to take the photograph of it, but that she was quite pleased with it. And Dora Mar, this is for object, the fur lined teacup, had been present at the sort of birth of the idea for that work. It was when Oppenheim was at a cafe with Dora Mar and Picasso in the first month or two of 1936 that the idea of covering a teacup saucer and spoon in fur sort of came out of a bantering conversation between those three artists so it's a wonderful sort of circular you know coming back home that mar is the one that takes one of those you know really important photographs of the object of of the teacup Obviously, one of the things about doing a show of Oppenheim is that you have to account for this sort of very brilliant early period and then a long impasse before she begins her career again in the 1950s. Can you tell us briefly about what happens after this kind of work, after the Magovernante? What happens to her work and why do we have to wait so long for her to really recover her career? Yes, so 1936 is a real kind of banner year because it's the year she makes these objects. She has her first ever solo show. She exhibits in a number of important surrealist group shows, but it's also the year that she leaves Paris. She goes back home to Switzerland. It has to do with her Her parents have been sending her money while she's been in Paris, and her father is forced to close his medical establishment in Germany because of their Jewish last name, and they go back to Basel. So the financial support dries up, and she goes back home. And the wartime years are difficult for her. She enrolls in art school for the first time, which is, I think, a quite important part of her story. And in that context, she learns how to like apply. She learns color theory. She takes courses in anatomy. She learns how to apply varnishes. And she makes a relatively small group of these quite extraordinary, fantastical narrative paintings that are very different than what she was making in Paris. So she's doing that in the late 30s and early 40s. 
Then after the war and into the early 50s, she isn't making a lot of work. It isn't a complete abstention from art making, but it's certainly a fallow period for her. She writes that in 1954, she suddenly emerges from this, what she will later call a crisis period, and like takes a studio in Bern and just suddenly spontaneously has completely recovered her will to really make art in a concentrated way again. And one thing we see that happens in the mid-1950s after the kind of epiphanic wake-up is that she starts really making objects again, which is an interesting sort of signal of her real intensive re-engagement with the art world. Okay, well, Natalie, thank you for telling us all about this work and this fascinating artist. Thank you. Merit Oppenheim, my exhibition, is at the Menil in Houston until the 18th of September and will then travel to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, opening on the 30th of October and continuing until the 4th of March, 2023. <music> And that's all for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julian Mihalska, Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Max, Amy and Sam and Natalie. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.